Okay, so we would like to start our session. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, um, welcome to the seminar on unlocking the potential of AI for development. My name is Byung Jo Kong. I'm a digital technology specialist at ADB. I'm the coordinator of this event. So it is my great pleasure to have you all here uh, to discuss about this one of the most pressing topic that we have these days, uh, which is AI. So just yesterday, I learned uh, this one Georgian proverb. Uh, and if I may, I want to start our session by sharing this proverb, which is uh, uh, having many children in the family uh, is fire as well as silver. So fire here, here means uh, challenges. Silver means uh, values. So those of you who already have kids might relate to this, but basically try to say that you know, having children can be very ch challenging but it also brings great values to your life. So I think this kind of captures the essence of what we're trying to do here. Uh, AI is our baby. Surely uh, it will come with uh, many challenges that we have to work together to overcome, but only then uh, we'll be able to benefit from all these uh, tremendous values and promises that AI can offer us. And of course we need to make sure that AI doesn't become a sport kid to you know, who could threaten the existence of humanity like some skeptics are concerned about. But I myself is more on the optimistic side of AI. So today we would like to discuss both fire and silver of AI. Uh, we have invited distinguished speakers from various industries. Uh, Thomas Abel, the Director of uh, Digital Technology for Development Division from ADB, will be the moderator of the discussion. And we have Google discussing the latest AI trends and technologies. Avoitis uh, Data Innovation, we discuss AI innovations in developing member countries. And MasterCard will speak on AI for finance. And the Alan Turing Institute will address the global AI governance and policy. And but not, last but not least, Khan Academy will talk about AI for education. Unfortunately, Sar Khan, the CEO of Khan Academy was not able to make it here in person, so he kindly sent us the video message. So following this presentation, we will proceed to a panel discussion for a more in-depth dialogue with the speakers. So without further ado, uh, for the opening remark, I would like to invite our Vice President for the Sectors and Themes of ADB, uh, Fatima Yasmin, to the stage for the opening remarks. Thank you, Byung Jo Kong. Good afternoon, distinguished panelists, guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to welcome you all to this annual meeting event um, on unlocking artificial intelligence potential for development. We are here today at a critical moment in history. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is advancing fast and pushing the limits of what we can do. Various AI technologies are revolutionizing sectors such as healthcare, finance, and education. But we know that any revolutionary changes has its own risks. This is the same with artificial intelligence. We need our collective wisdom and concerted efforts to make sure that changes brought by AI lead to widespread benefit for society while minimizing the cost. ADP is deeply committed to promoting the responsible and inclusive use of AI technologies. We want to help our developing member countries in their digital, digital transactions. In this context, I would like to highlight three main points. First, bringing the widening gap in AI 
is crucial. The fast progress of AI may increase the gap between those who have access to these technologies and those who do not. It is essential to provide equitable access to AI resources and technologies across the countries so that all DMCs can benefit from the ongoing improvement of AI tools and applications. Second, promoting responsible and ethical IA, AI is essential. We must ensure that AI systems uphold standard of transparency, accountability, and fairness. Starting from the creation of its algorithms, AI avoid biases and operate in a way that is safe and comprehensible to humans. Last, building our DMC's capacity to sustainably leverage AI opportunities is critical. Our priority must be to enable countries to not only adopt AI technology, but also to assist them innovate and develop their own solutions that address their specific needs and challenges. By doing this, our DMCs will not only the users, but also producers and contributors to the AI value chain. Distinguished participants, we are fortunate to have distinguished panelists to help us explore these important issues. We will look at the latest trends in AI and the practical AI solutions that help that have been implemented in our DMCs. With insight from industry experts, we will investigate AI governance frameworks on enabling and safe and responsible integration of AI technologies. We will also talk about the role of ADB in supporting our DMCs in these efforts. I look forward to productive discussions with our panelists and to gain valuable insights that can benefit our efforts to connect AI as a catalyst for a more inclusive, sustainable, and prosperous future for Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, VP Yasmin. Thanks, Byung Jo, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we're very happy to host this session as uh, one of the most important trends that we are trying to uh, address uh, within our um, Asian and the Pacific community. And uh, just a quick opening remark. I, I just want to say, you know, I started my career in Silicon Valley in 1994 at the beginning of the internet. and. Um, the feeling at that time was in many ways similar to what's happening with AI. Everybody knew it was gonna transform everything. Nobody knew how transformative it would be. And, and uh, you know, it just really felt like a time that um, the world was changing dramatically. And it did happen. Although with the internet, it didn't feel like the, the negatives were so out front with, as you see in AI. And I think that's where um, the response from civil society, from organizations like ADB, from governments themselves, uh, is now much more important. And, um, and I'm encouraged that the governments of the world have acted much more quickly than I could have imagined. And I think that um, you know, not, they're not necessarily doing the right thing, but you know, it, it, they're, they're definitely um, getting on this challenge and um, addressing the, you know, the concerns of the public. And ADB's role, you know, as a trusted advisor to our DMCs, we can add a tremendous amount of value because, you know, the, um, 
the private sector has generally a, um, you know, they have a, a commercial drive and uh, the, our, our partners, countries need to have um, a way of, uh, somebody who can convene, somebody who can bring resources, somebody who can be a trusted voice. And, um, you know, you all as a community are, are that um, way that we accomplish that. So uh, we're hoping through um, venues like this, through events that we host, and through our projects with our countries that we can actually um, really make a positive difference. So thanks again for everybody joining. And I will just quickly mention our um, distinguished panelists and um, have them all come up and have a seat. And um, they will provide more background on their, their bios. But uh, we have um, Anna, uh, uh, actually, we're going to go in order of the speaker. So we have Wilson White, VP of Global Affairs and Public Policy from Google. Thanks for joining, Wilson. We have uh, David Hardoon, CEO of Voitis Data Innovation. Thanks for coming, David. We have Rigo Vandenbroek from, uh, from MasterCard, Executive Vice President of Cybersecurity Product Innovation. And we have Anna Alania, a, an AI policy researcher from the Alan Turing Institute in uh, the UK. Um, and then, of course, Sal Khan, we have on video. Uh, we know he's the CEO of Khan Academy. And um, so thanks again for everybody coming. And what we will do, each one of the panelists is going to do a short presentation uh, to offer their perspective. And they can either do that up here or from their seat. And uh, I'll hand it off to Wilson. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And Tom, thanks for the, uh, the introduction. And uh, thank you to ADB for uh, one, bringing the conference to Georgia, but also for inviting Google to participate on this uh, esteemed panel. My name is Wilson White, uh, and I lead Google's government affairs and public policy team that supports our mobile and hardware business units. Uh, and recently, I, I was given the additional responsibility for running our government affairs and public policy operations here in the Asia Pacific region. Today, I have the distinct honor to introduce you to Google's AI vision and our policy agenda to address the opportunities and challenges in the AI era. Take a moment and imagine the world of 2050. Imagine a world where humanity has turned the tide against some of today's most daunting challenges. Imagine a, more, a world in which we've eliminated global food security, insecurity. Imagine a world in which we've cured cancers that defy treatments today. Imagine a world where technology allows us to avert climate catastrophe. Now ask yourself, what, what would it take to realize that future? What needs to happen to put those opportunities and solution, solutions in reach safely, collaboratively, and in a way that benefits everyone? Those are the questions that we're asking at Google. That's what we're thinking about at Google. And I start with that exercise because for the first time, advances in AI is allowing us to begin answering some of those questions, and many more, much earlier than 2050. If you're like most, you're open, excited even, about these opportunities, but also anxious about the risk. We get it. At Google, AI has been something that we've been thinking about and working on and building into our services for a long time. And that's why several years ago, we oriented the entire company around AI. We're committed to making AI even more helpful for people, for businesses, for communities, at scale, and for everyone. Now, to harness AI's promise, at Google, we believe the approach must be both bold and responsible. Now, while there can be tension between those two, we believe it's possible and even vital to embrace that tension. We know that the only way to be truly bold in the long term is to be responsible from the start. So I want to just walk through a few examples of how Google is making AI helpful for everyone. So the first is an example uh, that I want to share about a project we call Project Greenlight. It uses AI to optimize traffic lights at intersections around the world with the aim to help minimize traffic congestion and air pollution. 
We've been piloting this research in 12 cities around the world to predict traffic conditions and improve the timing of when traffic lights change. So far, we're seeing a 10 to 20% reduction in fuel consumption and delay at intersections. AI also has great potential to address the effects of climate change. One of the most harmful effects of climate change are wildfires, which affect hundreds of thousands of people every year around the world. And they're increasing in frequency and scale. With satellite data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, combined with Google's Earth Engine's data analysis capabilities, we're now able to identify and track wildfires in real time, helping predict how they will evolve and spread, putting vital information in the hands of emergency responders to literally save lives. Breast cancer, it's the, it's the most common form of cancer globally. More than two million people are diagnosed with breast cancer each year. We're working with clinicians, patients, and partners to build an AI system for mammography, which can help radiologists detect breast cancer, breast cancer more quickly and more accurately, even more so than the experts. Here in Asia, we're partnering with the Japanese Foundation for Cancer Research to improve the inclusivity of our AI models as breast density varies by race and ethnicity. So those are just a few examples of how we are using AI uh, to reach the benefits to as many people as possible. But Google has been pioneering the AI field for years, including several state-of-the-art advancements as early as 2015. These innovations are a result of our deep investments in AI research and technology. For example, our field-defining research on transformers in 2017 is now the basis of many of the generative AI applications we see today. I know many of you have probably heard of ChatGPT. Well, the T in ChatGPT is the Transformers research that we published over seven years ago. And all of these milestones have actually culminated in the release of our Gemini AI model. The Gemini ecosystem represents Google's most capable AI. It's our most flexible AI model to date. It can officially run, efficiently run on everything, from data centers to mobile devices. Our Gemini models are built from the ground up to be multimodal. This means that they can seamlessly reason across text or images or audio or video or even computer source code. Now, we recognize that the pace of change is rapid and the stakes are high. That's why Google's approach to developing and deploying AI is deliberate, thoughtful, and collaborative. We're committed and are guided by our AI principles, which we published in 2018, every step of the way. We're asking ourselves not just what we can do, but also what should we do and what should we not do. Learning from our experience on the internet, we tried to build smart checks and balances into our products and our services designing for social benefit from the ground up. Now, when it comes to policy and regulation, this is where Google pays me, uh, we're committed to working together with local leaders and experts to build smart and durable policy solutions for unlocking opportunity, promoting responsibility, and ensuring security. So how can we unlock the AI opportunity? A few things. First, invest in AI infrastructure and ensuring the right legal frameworks are in place to support innovation and responsible AI growth. Also, build an AI-empowered workforce by investing in human capital. And finally, promoting widespread adoption and universal accessibility for AI technology. Now, we think promoting responsibility is very important. Without trust in AI systems, businesses, consumers, users will be hesitant to adopt AI thus pre preventing them from benefiting from the technology. Our recommendation is a combination of a few things. So first, we encourage multi-stakeholder approaches to governance. Secondly, the adoption of proportionate risk-based frameworks that actually uh, focus on specific applications. And finally, international alignment with common policy approaches that avoid fragmentation and are rooted in and reflect democratic values. Now, with regards to security, 
we all face a global competition for AI superiority. The challenge is to maximize the potential benefits of AI for global security and stability while preventing threat actors from exploiting the technology for malicious purposes. So we think governments should do a few things in terms of the security piece. So first, governments should explore next generation trade control policies for specific applications of AI powered software. Secondly, governments should consider acquisition policies and reforming those acquisition policies to take advantage of world leading AI. We should also have a very collaborative approach to this, working across academia, civil society, governments, and the private sector. So AI is one of the most profound technologies that humankind is working on today. It will change everything about our lives. It will change the way we educate our children, the way we take care of our elderly, the way we treat our sick, and the way we protect the environment. The same way the internet fundamentally changed our lives, I truly believe AI will be the same. And we're committed at Google to maximizing the benefits of AI while mitiga mitigating those risks. And we should do that together. Thank you. Okay, um, David, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just make sure slides coming up. Is it? Uh, ah, okay. Thank you very much. Hi, and thank you very much for the invitation and being able to speak to everyone here. My name is David Hardoon. I'm the CEO of Aboitis Data Innovation. Aboitis is a conglomerate, uh, one of the largest in the Philippines, and relevant to, I think, the intro in terms of the DMCs, covers an area of energy, uh, power generation, distribution, cement manufacturing, construction, development, airports, and Coca-Cola, as well as shrimp, if you're interested. So, as you can imagine, being a data person, I, I, I get, I have a lot of fun. Um, prior to that as well, just to give an introduction about myself, I've also been on the other side of the fence, speaking about policy, I have an ex-regulator, uh, working as the CDO, ex-CDO of uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where we had the pleasure of putting it, one was the first, I won't quite say regulatory piece, but uh, guidelines with respect to the use of AI. Now, Aboidus Data Innovation, and why I want to mention this, we were created, as you can imagine, within the conglomerate to make AI real. And I'm not saying this as a marketing catchphrase. I truly mean it. Because one of the most important things, and we've all heard about it, in terms of the potential, what it can bring, how it will change the future, but we need to act today. And when the varsity of the different type of application of a conglomerate is how can we use it? So the examples I wanted to give briefly in the next few minutes in terms of how AI innovation is being used, and largely the work that we've been doing has been deployed in the Philippines can be done across in other locations. Now, this has actually been one of my favorite topics. I knew nothing about cement, and I don't know how much you do, other than the fact that it is extremely pollutant, let's just call a spade a spade, and it's the second most used substance in water. Now, one of the things that I've personally found immensely fascinating about the possibilities of AI, if you think about this world of sustainability, you think about this world of green and ESG, is we're focusing, as we should, on the alternative, on what will replace it. But the reality is, today, we have cement manufacturing plants. I won't go into the traverse details of the nine process, but I'll just say, imagine baking. That's basically it. And if some of you are perhaps slightly better ba cooks and bakers than me, uh, I have to do a lot of iterations. Well, that's exactly what happens with cement. By using AI, the underlying capability of it, which is effectively finding similarities and dissimilarities, resulted the improvement in the operations of that cement baking process. I don't know if you can see behind me, but not only resulted in millions of savings, because usually when people think about those kind of aspects of sustainability, it's like, it's gonna cost me, but measurable 35 kilotons reduction of CO2. This is operational for a year and a half in cement manufacturing plants in the Philippines. Imagine if that's rolled out. Very briefly, local government units asking themselves, how do we get on the bandwagon? 
in terms of using the possibilities of AI and working with them to really identify what are the potentialities, how they can leverage on it, what does it make a difference to them on the day to day. In this particular case, it's Victorious LGU, a very lovely place if you want to visit. And they've realized that they don't know where their emergency vehicles are. So a very simple, very simple application of AI in terms of locationing, IoT, corroborating and cross-validation that information. So then when a unfortunate catastrophe or the necessity of an emergency vehicle is needed, they know where it is and they can assign it to the right location. Again, simple things of how it can be and is being used today. An unfortunate reality, and I think something was mentioned earlier as well. If you are familiar with the Philippines, as with actually many other locations in the region, you have landslides, you have typhoons, you have earthquakes, you have pretty much everything that can happen. We have power plants. We have a lot of infrastructure that these get damaged. I'm not even mentioning the loss of lives, and this is a particular situation which was unfortunate because the area that we're working on actually had loss of life. Using geospatial data, using satellite information, topological information, again, using AI to do what AI does. Find potentiality, find irregularities, find risk, and providing that as an initial and early warning system for people on the ground. In our case, our industries, but also for the LGUs, for the communities, in order to help protect and prevent. Again, this is happening today. And, and I won't go to too much in finance because I realize we'll be talking about it, but I wanted to bring this up because and it, it's really that is the message there. It's the same by different. And one of the things that is phenomenal about it, and there's a different conversation that I think will come up later in terms of the ability of getting data to use it, but how can we take and provide financial, not just inclusion, in fact, I don't like the word inclusion. I'll tell you why. Because it doesn't talk about the next step, sustainability. How do we use AI and how are we using it today? In fact, we've been running it for now two years for uh, small propri uh, sole proprietors, micro medium enterprises, and retail in terms of providing them the opportunity of getting access to a financial service when they are, in the jargon, thin file or no file because they've never had a bank account. They've never had a credit card. They've never needed it. It was with essentially all cash. Again. Using, and I want to keep on emphasizing this point, relatively rudimentary and simple applications of AI in order to understanding who you are and the potential risk that you may pose in the likelihood of not paying back. But then concurrently, because guess what's the other problem that happens with financial sustainability? Scams, fraud, the equal necessity of, of education, financial knowledge, and the usage of AI in terms of protecting it. Now, as I want to mention, and I wanted to give a very brief introduction in terms of some of the applications of how it can be used and is being used in DMCs, I also want to talk about this, given the spirit of what ADI is, of to State Innovation, of walking the talk, ADB as well. And if, oh, can someone click, click? Por favor. <laughs> the application of um, 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 a project called Progeny, which will be out and running within the month. Is the video running? Okay. If not, we can all do it a bit later. But essentially, providing access to all the information, both internally within ADB as well as external ADB, in answering some, be it basic questions, be it more complex questions, such as relevance of climate, areas of concerns, necessities, needs, and congregating that information in a manner that can be used, and leveraging all the abilities from underlying NLM. So I guess this is not working, because I just very quickly just to show it in live mode. If not, it's okay, we can skip. We will skip it. We can show it later. So with that, thank you very much. We have uh, Vigo Vandenbroek, MasterCard. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Rieke van Broek, um, I'm lead cybersecurity for MasterCard globally, um, and I'm here on an AI session. Um, to be honest, they could have sent dozens of people like me to this session, because the, what I want to talk about is not about what AI is. At the end, AI is nothing more than you have a set of data 
with a lot of information, but you don't know what the information is, and you have a lot of outcomes, and it calculates the correlation between all this data and the outcome. And with that, it makes predictions, and those predictions can then become new rules in your system. That's machine learning, that's AI. I just want to make the basis. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is that everyone can use AI. Like even MasterCard, just joking. Um, so we use AI from the start, and why do we use it? Because we're a big company, we have a lot of data, but we are confronted with a reality that we have to identify what is good data, what is a good transaction, and what is a fraudulent transaction. And that's, so that is just, that rule, rule could say, okay, I can write rules, what is good and what is bad. Um, but the challenge is those rules are changing. Behavior of criminals are changing, behavior of people are changing, and I have to always distinct what is a good one and a bad one. And what is a good one in Dubai is a different one than a good one in the in Philippines. Or, the ex or what is a bad one is. So you, in, in order to run a global system, I need to do that. Now, every one of you here in the room has a huge amount of data. Yeah? Has also some predicted outcomes that they know about it. Can be, I know um, which things, data of my people, and I know um, a link to, for example, a certain use of certain services. And if I know the thing, I can build an AI model on top of it. I, there are, because there are two levels of AI. There is machine building the machine learning that builds machine learning rules, and, and then that software, but then the software is most of the application software. How do you use it? So MasterCard uses it in, in fraud, in identity solutions, in cyber solutions, in, um, in um, routing solutions, how to route traffic through this network. All these things are AI based. Why? Because we can't do it manually. Yeah? So at the end, what is AI driving? What is, why do you need AI versus just other programming? Because it gives you speed. It reacts faster than if a human needs to think about the rule. Just it goes faster. The second thing, what it brings at you, it's, it can be more precise. Um, it can be more precise because you take more data in, into calculation, so you can point it harder that the human being cannot have thought about when he writes down a rule. Um, and the third thing is scalability. It's much more scalable because at a certain moment, it's not really looking the data is not the most fun part of a life. Um, and it's what data scientists do, but it's kind of what it's hard. It's hard. So that are the three benefits that you get from AI. And so that's what I want to advocate for is Everyone has use cases in their home garden, in their, ho in their, in their country that they, you can use AI on. And that is where you at the end need to, to see how can I leverage that potential of my country in using AI. And um, at the end, from a cybersecurity point of view, I can also go into another direction, is, is how businesses are using AI, our governments are using AI, and, and we do a lot of government projects where governments are using our AI tools as part of figuring out is this information um, reliable for me? And, and can, I, can I, for example, uh, we are, we're part of the SyncPass project where we do the behavioral biometrics uh, behind the AI behavioral biometrics to identify if someone enrolls to this system, is that the person that should be enrolling to the system? Yeah? That's the decision that you take, and is it right, you know, is, it, is it legitimate? So that's kind of one example of what, what we do. But the data is in the Singapore government. It's not our data. It's Singapore government running that specific module, that specific software on their solution. And in that way, take better decisions to get a smooth uh, experience for people that enroll, but also make sure that criminals can't enroll. What is, and I think everyone every country in the world needs to evolve in AI. And the reason is, there's a, re there's a good reason, because it gives employment, it gives opportunities, and you can build nice things, but it's also, be aware, the criminals coming from cybersecurity are also using AI. So I'll give an example of how criminals are using AI at large scale. So criminals um, on, the dark, on the dark web have, um, have used applications, language learning models, I will not name a brands, language learning models, where they ask, give me um, a 16 digit number that starts with those codes from a certain bank that have the right check digits, and this create like real card numbers. Just ChatGPT or something like that can create that. 
and they can create it hundreds. Yeah? In the past, what criminals do is they try to try an error rate. They, they tried one, failed, okay, next one, next one, next one. Now they can already get real card numbers. So that means that your fraud system to detect that has to be much more faster because the number of tries that the criminals are doing is way less, and in that way you have to react faster. So that's one use that they do. The second part of the, and then they use AI for that. The second part they do is they have done these stolen credentials, and they have now created um, on the dark web um, testing sites where they just say, here is a testing module that will generate scripts to test card numbers. And they will then say to the other criminals that are wanted to buy this card number, this is a card number that works um, in that country and, or in that region and doesn't work in that region. So they even say where and how to misuse it. At the end, the criminals are not doing anything that, that business people will do because at the end, what they're doing is be more efficient, be faster, be more scalable. Same thing. So in that way, think about that. If, if you then organize your defense, you probably need to think about an AI in your defense system as well to fight fraud, to fight crime um, in an efficient way. So the way we propose to work together um, um, as MasterCard with, with, with governments is around three different, three topics. Um, there are three things we think are foundational to be successful in AI and in, 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 in defense in a country. The first thing, and I'll think that will be covered a few times, but it's education. You need to have people with the right technology, know-how. You have to work with universities, your, your, your schools around an educational program to have more people with technology background. I'm not saying AI background, I'm saying technology background and that, have, that you can help and that putting programs that is crucial for the development of a country. The second way MasterCard wants to help, and MasterCard is willing to help on setting up with universities this curriculum, local universities organized for your citizens in your country and working together on, on, on that educational platform that they get access to that uh, information to get the best uh, learning as possible. The second domain we want to work together and we think is crucial is the exchange of information. It is, you can't do, if, if I, the exchange of information is crucial and I, I speak here about threat intel information and in the type of information, it is um, at the end, in order to be successful um, in AI models, you have to have access to data. You have a lot of data, but you also have to know, know the outcome of the data. So we think there's a lot of exchange that can happen between countries and international organizations on the exchange of data and to help your models, to, uh, to help you build your models for, for, uh, uh, for uh, AI, which is important because without the models, without the data, you can't train an AI system, you can't develop the rules and so on. That's the reason why as a second domain of, of cooperation that we are very eager to discuss. And the third domain of, of, uh, of cooperation is at the end, um, is a domain where we think that, um, that we are all a bit not doing enough. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it in that way. The challenge for us is in, 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 in a global economy is that 80% and even more of our economy is driven by small, very small companies. <laughs> People that want to sell things. And more and more these companies are going on the digital way and going digital because they want to get a bit more spread of, of how they can, who they can reach. The challenge is if you don't make that digital roadmap also a security and AI roadmap, you will get into trouble later. So you need to do design the solutions, design the infrastructure, design the deployment of digital in line with also security requirements and how, how you use AI from the start. Because if you don't use from the start, you get into legacy and then it's very hard to evolve it. So that's the third domain where I think cooperation between public, private sector is really, really crucial to solve these three problems that everyone has in this room. So with that, um, I do want to thank you for your attention. We focus, and I'll give one last piece of advice. We want to focus as MasterCard to work together around three pillars is um, assess what AI can do, assess what are the opportunities and figure out where can I use AI, what data I have and I figure, my assessment part is a very important part. 
The second one is then deploy some of the solutions. But the last part we want to focus on is also what we call organized, and it's the cooperation public-private sector. Crucial, crucial, crucial. And I think every company around this, and I think Google the same thing, Musk the same thing, we are willing to do that. And we are all willing to do that with you in the country, with citizens in the country, to build up in your countries a very sustainable AI future for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Rigo. And, uh... Hi, everyone. Mogis Salma with Wallace. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here to share my thoughts. I feel very honored to speak in my home country, which I've never done before. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a delight to share the stage with, with uh, such brilliant experts on the topic of AI. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am an AI policy researcher at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the uh, National Institute, UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. We were founded in uh, 2015, and since then our mission has been to make great leaps in uh, data science and artificial intelligence research um, in order to change the world for the better. I'll talk a little bit more about the Alan Turing Institute and what we've been doing there later, but I wanted to use this time in my opening remarks uh, to really set the scene of what um, sort of current AI governance landscape looks like. Um, what are some of the trends that are emerging? How uh, different jurisdictions and international entities are approaching policy challenges presented uh, by AI? As we've already heard, AI brings significant benefits. My colleagues on the stage talked about cancer diagnosis, um, early um, sort of help with uh, um, challenges presented uh, by global warming. Um, so, but um, part of, big part of my job is to think about uh, what are the trade-offs? What are some of the harmful externalities uh, that come with widespread uh, adoption of AI? Things like violation of uh, fundamental rights, um, discrimination, disinformation, job displacement, and also how can we uh, respond to these challenges um, efficiently and effectively? Over the last few years, there have been many great international efforts uh, to counteract these risks um, um, through the collective development of high-level principles and guidelines. I'll give you a few examples. In 2019, uh, OECD member countries adopted um, principles for trustworthy AI. In 2021, UNESCO's recommendation on ethical, uh, ethics of artificial intelligence were um, adopted by all of its 193 member countries. Uh, last year, um, G7 leaders signed um, G, um, Hiroshima AI process, uh, which set out guiding principles for AI and also released a voluntary code of conduct for AI developers. Last year also in the UK, we held AI Safety Summit where 28 countries signed the Bletchley Declaration. So great progress has been made within international fora on what outcomes we want from AI governance. We know we want AI systems to be safe, secure, robust. We know we want uh, AI systems to respect um, human rights, promote fairness and inclusivity. We know we want AI used to be transparent and decisions made by uh, AI systems to be explainable and when or if things go wrong for there to be roots for redress. Uh, but how we implement those principles in, uh, into practice is the next big challenge that uh, countries are facing in the backdrop of this exponentially increasing capabilities of AI. In answering these questions um, of how we um, sort of implement these broad principles into practice, our research at the Alan Turing Institute has identified several policy considerations or policy dimensions that countries are having to think about. There are too many to share today, but I'll highlight three of them. First one is, how should we regulate AI? Should we govern AI with hard, hard laws and regulations, or should we rely on soft law mechanisms? And we're finding that countries are taking diverging approaches uh, in answering this question. Um, 
so far only a small number of jurisdictions like Canada, China, Brazil and EU have introduced legally uh, binding uh, policies for AI, while a big majority is still relying on voluntary policies uh, and industry self-regulation to guide uh, responsible AI development and use. Having said that, Rapid developments in AI, um, especially in the context of large language models, is instilling a sense of urgency in policymakers to consider um, more stringent regulatory frameworks. Uh, and that's reflected in the discourse that we're uh, seeing around um, AI regulation. Second policy consideration is, do we go govern AI in a context, sector, or use case specific way, or do we govern it holistically? A sectoral approach involves uh, developing guidance and rules bounded by a specific sector uh, or industry, industry uh, like finance, healthcare, uh, transport. Uh, the UK, um, the country where I uh, work, uh, has so far gone down this sort of path of sectoral uh, regulation. Um, the UK government has published a white paper last year which asks asks existing uh, sectoral regulators in the country to develop guidance within their remit. On the other side, some jurisdictions are choosing to enact more horizontal regulation. This means rules that apply to um, every sector and use case. A good example of this, of course, is the EU AI Act, uh, which is one of the most influential um, cross-sectoral AI uh, regulation to date, and it's already influencing and inspiring other regulatory regimes in countries like Canada, Brazil. And finally, how do we set proportionate measures for different applications of AI? And here we're seeing a common theme emerge, uh, and some of my colleagues have already talked about this, a risk based uh, approach um, or the idea that the degree of regulatory intervention should be proportionate uh, to the impact of risks. So if an AI application has a minimal risk, uh, they wouldn't be subject to legal um, obligations within a given framework. Uh, while high-risk systems um, in healthcare, in transportation, for example, um, in recruitment, um, they will have ad to adhere to um, more stringent requirements. We're seeing a risk-based approach take a central role in the EU's AI Act, as well as uh, Brazil's new AI bill, um, Canada's AI and Data Act. To conclude, I wanted to highlight that as countries are sort of beginning to uh, implement these high-level principles into practice and, and grapple with these diff quite difficult policy questions, um, quite a heterogeneous AI landscape is emerging. And while a divergence in approaches is not completely unexpected, uh, we're quite conscious that a fragmented regulatory ecosystem for AI could risk placing a heavy burden on AI developers and slowing down the development and distribution of beneficial AI systems. At the Turing, we're increasingly thinking about what regulatory interoperability looks like. Um, so different regulatory frameworks working seamlessly um, together. So if I am an AI um, developer in, the, in Georgia, for example, and I want to sort of uh, trade internationally, how can I do that without having to be familiar with all the different regulatory systems and, and all the different requirements and certifications mechanisms and so on. And we're also thinking about how sort of what forms of international collaboration and coordination is needed to uh, advance uh, responsible AI and to ensure that its benefits are shared equitably across different um, countries and societies. So I'll stop there and I look forward to talking more about these topics uh, during the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, wide range of perspective, and uh, I think we were very lucky to get all of you to uh, come to our meeting, and um, especially um, Anna being uh, from Georgia, and we, very special. So um, the next, um, we have time now with Sal Khan uh, to share his thoughts via video. And Sal Khan, I don't know if everyone knows of Khan Academy, but Sal Khan. Um, basically has a um, nonprofit education solution that's just publicly available as a free and open public good. And it's been transformative in some contexts, uh, certainly in the United States where he founded it. He's originally from Bangladesh, but 
Um, it really is um, a revolutionary educational platform because it's free and open. It's not driven by um, you know, the profit motive. And he has been an early pioneer in incorporating AI into that. And he will, he's, a, he's a very good speaker and will, will relate to that. And then um, it's also for, for our mission to bring development to our um, partner countries, um, this is the kind of example that we need to look at because the solution that they have is, is somewhat controversial and it's not necessarily just an instant success either, but they're really um, doing a very thoughtful rollout of it. And to hear his perspective on it, I think would be very valuable. So um, we'll roll the video with Sal Khan, thanks. The Development Bank, Sal Khan here from Khan Academy. And obviously there's a lot of talk of artificial intelligence these days, and some might think some of it is hype, and some of it probably is, and there's definitely some reasons to worry. But I'm a strong believer that at least in the space of education, it might be one of the biggest opportunities, if not the biggest opportunity of, of our lifetime. And to just get a sense of, of the context here, I'll take you back to how Khan Academy got started. You go back to 2004, I was a year out of business school, my original background was in tech, I was an analyst at a hedge fund now, and my family was visiting me in Boston, where my, my wedding was in New Jersey, but was visiting me in Boston after my wedding from New Orleans, and it just came out of conversation that my 12-year-old cousin Nadia was having trouble in math. I offered to tutor her remotely when she goes back to New Orleans, and it works out. That same Nadia that was having trouble, she was really put into a remedial track in her math class, after a few months of one-on-one -on -one tutoring, was able to accelerate and become one of the top math students in her class. So I was hooked. I started tutoring her younger brothers. Word spreads in my family that free tutoring is going on. And so before I know it, I'm tutoring 10, 15 cousins, family, friends all over the country. And I saw a common pattern. Uh, they were, for the most part, trying to do their best. Uh, they were mostly A or B students. They had decent uh, teachers. But the reason why they were struggling, especially in math, but this is really applies to all subjects, is they had gaps in their knowledge. Uh, they were in an algebra class, they forgot how to manipulate negative decimals or, the, uh, or, or, um, or negative exponents or divide decimals. And so that tutoring allowed me to zero in on exactly what they need and also motivate them to keep going, make sure they had fluency, et cetera. But you could imagine when you scale from one cousin to 15, uh, it became a little bit harder. Uh, so I started writing software for them. Uh, really to try to scale myself up as a tutor, which is a theme <laughs> that is, you'll, you'll hear me talk a lot about. And uh, that was the first Khan Academy, uh, these practice exercises that could adapt to where a student is. And that was back in 2005, 2006. A friend suggested I make videos to complement those practice exercises. I initially thought that was a horrible idea. Why would I make YouTube videos? Uh, but I, I got over the idea that it was not my idea. And... Um, my cousins famously told me that they liked me better on YouTube than in person. And I believe what they were saying is they appreciated the interest I was taking in their life, but when it was 11 p.m. and they're working on their homework and there's no one there to help them, having a video is awfully convenient. They could watch it as many times as they want, half speed, double speed. If they were in an algebra class and they forgot some of their arithmetic, they didn't have to feel embarrassed, no matter how non-judgmental their cousin might be and they could watch those videos. So I took it as positive feedback, kept going, and it, it was clear that obviously other people who are not my cousins started watching. You fast forward over the years, and if you think about what Khan Academy has been doing for the last 15 or 16 years as a not-for-profit with the mission of free world-class education for anyone, anywhere, it's really been trying to scale what I was originally doing with Nadia, trying to approximate it somehow, knowing that we couldn't fully approximate a one-on-one -on -one tutor with a uh, just video or just adaptive software. We also have made teacher tools over the years. So it's a teacher in a class of 30, 35 students, they don't have to do the same thing for all 30 students. The 30 students could work at their own time and pace, teacher gets real information, and then they could do more focused interventions with the five kids who need trouble, who have trouble with decimals, or the other 10 kids who need a review of their exponents, whatever it, whatever it might be. And before we even talk about artificial intelligence, we've seen really good gains there. Khan Academy is you know, now 160 million plus registered users. It's in almost every country in the world and there's been 50 plus efficacy studies on it. I believe we're the most studied ed tech platform out there. And pretty much every study says the same story. If students are able to put in 30 to 60 minutes a week over the course of a year, about 18 hours a year, 
which isn't a lot over the course of a year, they're accelerating, depending on the study, 20, 30, 40, 50% more than their peers. And lately we've had some studies where we're able to compare students to themselves uh, over two years. And the ones that put more time into Khan Academy accelerated more. And the ones that put less time in decelerated in terms of their, their rate of improvement. So we think it's not just correlative, we think there's, there's actually some good uh, causal data there. But once again, it's still um, attempting to approximate what I was able to do uh, with, with my cousin, although obviously doing it at a much larger scale than I was able to do that. You fast forward now to summer of 2022, Sam Altman, Greg Brockman from OpenAI reach out and they said, hey, we're gonna have our next model. We uh, think this is gonna be the model that's gonna wake people up to the power of AI, but it's going to be exciting, but also scary. So we wanna launch with organizations that people trust that can show social positive use cases that have the technical capability to take advantage of this of this technology and Khan Academy was the first group that we thought of. I was skeptical at first, I had seen GPT-2, GPT-3, but when I saw what GPT-4 was capable of, and you can imagine this was four or five months before even ChatGPT came out, and ChatGPT, when it came out, was based on GPT-3.5. So here was a model, still had some issues, hallucinations, making up facts, the math wasn't particularly good, but it was able to seemingly reason much more than previous versions of some of these large language models. And we were able, with not a lot of work, to at least start to get it so that it could take on the type of tutoring persona, a motivating persona, a teaching assistant persona. And so that's when we decided as an organization that as rough and imperfect as this technology is, we can't ignore it. So, and we had all the debates in the organization. You know, how do we make sure there's safety? How do we make sure there's transparency for teachers? How do we put guardrails? How do we make sure uh, that uh, we can mitigate the hallucinations and the math errors. But if we do all of that, can we show that this can get us even further on that path to making a, a scalable tutor? Once again, similar to what I was able to do for Nadia, but can we scale it by a factor of a billion? Um, and so that's what we've worked on, that that is what is Conmigo. We ended up launching as part of the GPT-4 launch back in March of 2023, which now, now feels like forever ago, but we're not talking about uh, that long ago. And what's been really interesting, and obviously this is a very rapidly evolving environment, but we are seeing that it is uh, able to engage students closer to the way that I was able to engage. Now, I'm not gonna claim that it's a full equivalent to a full tutor, but the more and more that we're working on it, we're realizing that we can get there, where it can not give you the answer, but have a Socratic dialogue with the student. Uh, provide teachers insights on what the students are up to, so really act as a teaching assistant. Help teachers with things like lesson planning, grading papers, et cetera, so they have more time and energy for themselves and for their students. As opposed to a cheating tool for something like writing an essay, it can be used, we're building on Conmigo, where a teacher can construct the assignment with the AI, the rubric with the AI, assign through the AI, and the student works on it with the AI. The AI acts as a coach, not as someone who just does the essay. And then the AI can report back to the teacher, not just the final output of the essay, but actually the whole, the whole process of how uh, the, the student developed it and whether it's consistent with the student's other work, which one, undermines any form of cheating, much less AI cheating, but even more provides more support and more context than, than teachers have, have ever had. So we are already um, just in the US now working with uh, approaching 100,000 students and teachers by uh, this coming school year. It'll be many hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And we're also looking, and we're also looking at how this is, is spreading internationally. We have some very interesting projects happening in Brazil, in India, uh, in the Philippines, uh, in Vietnam. I could, I could keep uh, listing more locations. And even though uh, large language models introduce a new cost, a new significant marginal cost that wasn't there with just a website. A website has a marginal cost, but every time someone goes to it, it's you know fractions of a penny. While frontier models like GPT-4, or now you know you have others from Google and Anthropic and others, they 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 could cost you know many dollars a month or or a year, and so we have to think about how we resource that. But uh, I'm confident you know the costs are coming down dramatically. And what's also interesting is when you, the, the capacity that you might need for an India or a Philippines or Vietnam, that's at the opposite side of the planet as, as the United States. So we are building the capacity for the United States to serve that market, but then we might have surplus capacity that we might be able to offer at a much lower marginal cost 
um, on the other side of the planet. And the reason why I'm so excited about this, obviously Khan Academy's mission is free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. I think that if we get out there, start putting in programs, that in the next two to five years, uh, you really can have a, a, a world where anyone on the planet, obviously Khan Academy already has the exercises, the videos translated into 50 plus languages, but above and beyond that, for students and parents and teachers to interact with an AI that really feels similar to the type of interaction that Nadia had with myself. And obviously the ideal circumstance is not just to have the AI, not to just have Khan Academy. The ideal is to have it as part of an ecosystem. We've always said Khan Academy's goal, we definitely want to raise the floor for those who have nothing. If you're in a village and there's no one who can teach you algebra, there's no school, we want to give you world-class education if you just have access to a smartphone so it raises the floor for you. But ideally, you are part of a community. You have access to a school, and then we want to raise the ceiling. We want to make it more personalized. We want to make sure that it's truly world-class, that the signals of knowledge that you're getting will be recognized anywhere in the world. And you know, this is obviously something I strongly believe in even before AI. But now with artificial intelligence, I genuinely think that we have a chance uh, to, to hit this vision of free world-class education for anyone, anywhere, a lot sooner than anyone uh, would have originally thought of. You know, there's a lot of hope and fear around AI, and I'm afraid of several of the applications of AI, things around deep fakes, et cetera. I think it will be disruptive in certain parts of the job market. But I think in the education space, I generally think it's going to be an unambiguous good. It's going to democratize access, democratize education, empower students, parents, and teachers. Teachers are going to be able to focus on what humans do best, forming those connections, motivating students, make, forming a, a, a community. And you know, I think there's just something very beautiful about this idea of leveraging artificial intelligence to do maybe what I think is the most important thing, and that's to improve human intelligence and human potential. Thank you. I'm, I'm amazed he was able to do all of that in one take, but you can tell he um, speaks on the topic a lot. And I really, we wanted to um, have him here, but he couldn't join, um, but because he's a very early partner, it's something to watch in education. And um, it has its glitches, you know, you can look at all the press, and uh, it's a very interesting model. Uh, and I would add that, um, you know, ADB has many, many projects underway that are utilizing AI, and, um, and one example is Byung-Joe um, is supporting Bangladesh, the primary education system, to develop uh, a, a, basically a, a generative AI solution for teachers to allow them to generate lesson plans and exam questions and um, we went through a process of assessing we don't have the resources of a Khan Academy or the connection to OpenAI and Google that they have um, and, and it was a fairly small project so we said let's not build something that the, that the students are gonna interact with directly because we don't wanna take that risk. So we built something that's really geared for teachers and byung -Jo actually did the first ever training of teachers in Bangladesh on AI and most of them had never even heard of AI. So you, you really have a range of, of situations that people are in where people are just now getting access to smartphones and we have to serve that need and then we can look at something like Khan Academy as a leading edge uh, sandbox because it is free and open and geared towards a, a global um, public good. Um, and so we want to look at all of these things and, and find out where they're succeeding, where they're failing. Um, nobody really knows what the best path is, but we are taking uh, a wide ranging approach. Um, Byung Jo is our only AI specialist in, in our team, probably the only one in, in the bank that actually has a uh, uh, you know, academic background in AI and um, those kinds of skills are rare and far between and he's engaged in a wide range of um, programs, you know, from policy dialogue with some of our governments to um, agriculture, AI solutions, solutions for supporting elderly um, and, and I think the potential for this to revolutionize so many things that we're doing is, is uh, almost impossible to, um, you know, to um, summarize. So we're, we're looking forward to you know, continue to work with all of you, all of our uh, partners in um, our developing member governments and 
certainly all of our um, our um, private sector and and uh, organizational partners. So um, with that, we are going to switch to a panel discussion. And if anyone has questions from the audience, um, we can raise that. And then, or if you're on the uh, the app, if folks are, I'll, I'll be checking that. So. Um, We'll, we'll go to the audience first because you raise your hand right away and uh, it's great to have audience engagement. Um, do we have a mic? You can use my mic, I guess. Oh, they're ringing. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I think those are fantastic comments. Great learning experience for me, at least. Uh, my question is directed uh, to the lady from the Alan Turing Institute. And you mentioned the use of AI to combat human rights violations. That's what I understood. How does that work? Because I never thought that you know, somehow you could connect AI with human rights violations. Is that, is that working? Um, I think there may have been a bit of a miscommunication, maybe on my part, because I think what, what, what I was saying is, uh, part of my job is to look at externalities and sort of harmful impacts of AI uh, and sort of impacts on human rights is one of the things that we're looking at. Violations of privacy, for example, is one of them. Discrimination, um, unfair treatment, um, that sort of thing. So I think that's what I was alluding to. My apologies if that was uh, a sort of miscommunication there, that's, but that's what I was um, referring to there. Great. Um, I will ask, oh, question in the back, go ahead. Yes, hello there. Uh, in 1984, James Cameron uh, told us the story about the future of the artificial intelligence and the st long story of the Terminator showed us the outcomes of so-called friendship with the artificial intelligence and the latest series of Terminator Genesis told us how it could, be, it could become the integral part of the human human's world and life, and how we could protect in the future ourselves, and how we could guarantee that this kind and friendly artificial intelligence won't become an enemy somehow. Thank you. Let me just start on that, because this is so important. Um, I would say that all technologies have been used for good and bad. And um, I, my first job was in a nuclear weapons lab, Los Alamos National Labs. And the way the world responded to the threat of nuclear weapons has been effective, but it's still a risk today. And I think AI is, um, is similar. And the fact also that the AI companies that are leading the charge, that really are um, the masters of that technology, are very few. And um, those companies already have tremendous power. And it's up to the society and governments to make sure that it's regulated appropriately where these risks are understood and minimized, but the upside is also not thrown out. Um, the way nuclear power was developed in, par in parallel with nuclear weapons, you know, these things need to be um, thought through. But I would also say there's no guarantee that we will do it successfully, so we have to be e extra careful. And I'll, I'll pass on to the, the panelists. It's a good question for anybody. Yeah, first of all, um, if you make movies, you don't, the scenario that it all went fine is not a fan fun scenario to, to make a movie from. So it's biased by default, which is one of the problems of AI that could, I, that you, bias is the problem. So. If, what is a challenge in AI is that you feed in data and data and you have an, a predicted, an outcome that you know and you're correlating, like I said. The challenge is that in your data, without knowing, you can have bias and that cr can create rules that are, for example, discriminating or, or something that, is, that you don't immediately think, uh, even if you have gender not your qualification criteria and you rule it out, an other indicator might have gender as an secondary influencer, and in that we create bias. So be aware that when, when we speak about AI, and the majority of the AI systems are run on a server or run on a cloud, and 
are creating um, an outcome of a prediction of, a, of something. Even if you use that then in machines to do um, mechanic maneuvering or anything on that side, it is still planned for something. It's still in a purpose that they, they do this. And yes, they can learn to move a bit more left and right and to be doing something a bit more precise. But thinking it will be, um, AI will, will take over the world and then and then be that violent X thing that, that you mentioned, that's, 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 that is only when it's developed for that purpose. Yeah? And that is where we all have a, a social responsibility with the companies. And that's the companies that are working on it are very eager to say, we want to use it for the right things in society. We want to use it for better learning. We want to use it for better security. We want to use it for better all these things, but at the end, that's what you have to work on. An AI machine or machine learning system on its own will never get violent, yeah? um, unless there was an intention from the builder of to make it violent. Let's make it that way. So I'll jump in on that. I actually, uh, Rigo, you, you joked about the, the Hollywood factor of this. I actually spent three months uh, at Google trying to get a project whereby we actually work with writers in Hollywood to write a movie that actually shows the other side of this uh, thing. Obviously, I failed at that because uh, the, the movie is not out yet. Um, but uh, as Thomas said, there's a few companies who are really doing this work at scale, who are really developing and deploying uh, this technologies. Uh, I think that's promising because some of these companies, like the company I work for at Google, we're thinking about how to do it responsibly, right? And if we're doing that and we're leading the way and so that everyone who's developing and deploying this uh, is doing it in a responsible way, I think we mitigate against this uh, obvious risk that, that, that you've highlighted here. Uh, at Google, one of the things that I'm proud of is when we launched our AI principles in 2018, we talked about the things that we stood for in AI. We want to make sure it's fair and that we perfect, uh, protect privacy and, and human rights. Uh, but we also had a list of things that we would not use our AI for. And that was very difficult for a company like Google early in the process of AI to publicly state areas that it would not use AI to develop in. Uh, and we did that as a signal to the broader AI community that these risks are real uh, and that as we are developing it, we should actually take that proactive approach to mitigating some of these risks. So I think that the thinking there, plus the fact that governments around the world are not waiting until AI is fully baked to get involved in terms of these guardrails, I think we're putting the processes in place to, to mitigate some of these existential risks. Um, maybe just, oh, sorry. Uh, very, very briefly, just to add to the gentleman, and, and I'll pass over. And I want to give an answer from both hats that I've had as a practitioner, well, I've always been a practitioner, but now on the industry side and uh, you know, paying for my sins and then previously as a regulator. We don't have laws that force you to look left and right when you cross the road, but you look left and right and cross the road because that sustained your ability to cross the road. So I always find it strange when, when you find all these companies saying, oh, we need to have regulations to do it and we will wait until that comes out. It's like, huh? Just do it. Every single use case, every single application that we build, we build, deploy, we apply common sense and we apply what we believe are the right things at the lack of explicit regulations and requirements. And we also have transparency that if we do make a mistake, we'll call it out and we will amend it. That's number one. Number two, and I kind of feel that a lot of times we, we it's like you know, missing the, the forest from the trees. Because we keep on talking about AI. Actually, it's nothing to do about AI. Even what you mentioned right now, it's the use cases. And that's a different, actually, underlying conversation. Then, just very briefly, on the, the, the regulatory side, so when we came up with the fee principles back when I was in MAS, so the Fairness, Ethics, Accountability, and Transparency principles, 2018 as well. And it was one page. Because I had, I had enough of these you know, booklets that can kill small animals. It's like, enough, just one page with principles and guidelines and where things should be done. And I will never forget this. I gave this to my governor at the time. He read it, looked at me and said, David, this is common sense. I was like, yes, Gov. <laughs> that's, that's exactly it. So the way we achieve that future that we want, and I'll go back to what a salesperson used to tell me, is hope is not a strategy. Is we just need to apply common sense and sometimes fight the urge uh, that we have as humans is self-interest versus the interests of the common good. 
Just a small note to add, I think I wanted to just stress that sort of conversations around AI risks need to be always rooted in evidence of tangible harms that we're seeing. And um, in media, in movies, of course, but in media as well, we're seeing um, sort of sensationalist view of AI uh, harms, that AI is going to crawl out of a computer and kill us all. Um, and, and this sort of existential threat, I mean, it's worth investigating, but it's sort of, we need to realize that that cannot be a distraction from those very tangible harms that we're seeing. And it's a distraction. It also takes away resources from policymakers. Uh, if we concentrate all these far-fetched risks that who is going to talk about privacy, who's going to talk about um, those things that we need to uh, have rules on um, today. So we can think about it, but not at the expense of those uh, tangible harms. Anna, maybe you should give your example that you mentioned before. The, Which one? The, the car. Sorry? The car, ex the car example. Mm -hmm. The car example. I don't okay. So the example that we discussed before is, so AI, what is AI at the end? And so at the end is, um, the, the, the comparison you can take is, they're giving you a car. Yeah. Now you can use a car to kill everyone. Yeah. You, you can do it today. Should we then forbid cars? So that's the logic. That is, it's still a driver. That even self-driving cars, they do that, that. That's the principle they're programmed on, on to avoid <laughs> to bump into things, and especially people. So there's zero tolerance on that one. So just be aware. It's not because something can be used in the wrong way that it has to be that it will be used for the wrong way by everyone. Yeah. So that's the that's the example. Sorry. All right. Over here. Um, we had two, uh, two people raise their hand. Go ahead. Um, thank you for very interesting insights. Uh, um, I represent Lightspeed Digital. It's a fintech-oriented consulting company that I'm founder of. And I, I was interested to dwell more on the generative AI, because we're broadly talking about AI uh, and in the, in the direction of development. But what about Gen AI for development? And specifically, I wanted to ask you, uh, about the, uh, so most of the Gen AI models are English centric. And when we are talking about development in developing countries, most of them, I mean, they are not so English centric. Yeah, most of their populations don't talk English, um, don't speak English. And their digital literacy skills are also way lower than if you compare to Western uh, developed countries. So in, in your, um, based on your experience and also like policy approach, and specifically I'm asking Wilson now and also it would be great if others also join in that. Uh, what would be the best approach coming from the government to develop more, uh, you know, like, uh, how to say, like, development-oriented LLM or la large language model? Uh, one area is, based on my research, was to do it uh, more, I've customized uh, to kind of like code in the local uh, kind of like language uh, specifics, yeah? So what are other areas that we can think of that you can offer to the government and if you already have this type of cooperation with the government in any developing country? Thank you. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. Phenom phenomenal question, and it's something that we've been thinking very hard about at Google because uh, historically when we did product launches at Google, you would launch one product, largely a US or Western kind of mindset with the product, and then you would launch it and just hope it works and hope, hope it's like locally relevant, right? That's fundamentally changed uh, over the years, right? One, our business has evolved and, and matured, but I think AI is also given the power to have super local solutions to our products. On this area that you're talking about, one area, specific example of where we're doing this is in India, uh, where, yeah, many people speak English, but millions of people do, don't speak English, right? And there are hundreds of languages that are spoken in India. Uh, and one of the things that we can do from a technology standpoint is build the actual model, right? And our Gemini model can do that with, with language translation, but the Indian government has the data. They have the examples of the various languages that are, are used. And so if we can make our language processing models available through APIs and other, and other, and other ways, 
match that with the government's data, now you can actually have this model really powering the technology and making it relevant to people who aren't English speakers. And that's an active uh, project that we've been working on with the Indian government already, and that's actually benefiting other countries around the world with that type of cooperation. So for us, I think it's investing in the technology, building the model, but also making that model accessible so that others can benefit from it. Um, maybe very quickly, just an example is also from the Philippines where there's a lot of languages <laughs> there as well. Um, so, so one, just, just to reiterate, absolutely, because it's, it's a pyramid, and if you think about ultimately even LLMs, it's an ensemble of capabilities, and actually one should leverage on the data that's available, but of course translation kicks in significantly. But beyond that, as you find that a lot of it, if you go back to the uh, to transfer models and the ability to actually build it on different domains, one of the things that we did is in language uh, spoken, where we're actually able to show that we can actually build a model for authentication and recognition um, that you could actually train it in one language and you could speak to it in any other language because of the context of how it's being underlying you use effectively. So, what, so there's definitely multiple ways, but what you kind of find that becomes really important and where there's the opportunities of collaborations, broad understanding, uh, creating of even if incremental models, but essentially get the DMCs on the road when they say there isn't sufficient data available, that's definitely where I think more corporations, more collaborations is extremely necessary and needed because it's, it's, it's effectively a situation of not poor and rich from an economic point of view, but poor and rich in terms of data accessibility. I think this is a very important point and thanks for raising it. That, um, and I don't think it's very well known how the partnership with Google and the Indian government, because in traditionally the Google models were run on their own data and they owned the whole thing. And with the Indian government, it's a more of a partnership. And I think that you know, every country has their own cultural heritage and they want to preserve that. But how do you, you know, and we, we were asking this question, do you create an efficient translator or do you build an entire model in your own language with your own cultural heritage? Uh, that's, I think, still an open question. But I think all of these approaches need to be explored and, you know, Companies like Google are good partners for that because they see only upside in, uh, you know, propagating this. And Google is also one of the first ones that came out with onboard language translation on a low-end smartphone without having to use data. And they have some incredible videos out of India showing people who are illiterate, who have transformed their lives by being able to read documents the, through an onboard translation on their phone. And it's really trans, and that's be before generative AI. Now generative AI will in engage a conversation. You know, it still needs to be obviously um, refined, but it's going to open up so much for people who don't have the literacy, and the numeracy to access current uh, digital uh, tools and capabilities. I wanted to briefly speak to small small languages and indigenous languages. And I think the reality is the um, this sort of this industry of large language models is driven by big uh, private sector organizations that are essentially realistically driven by business interests and um, sort of creation of large language models in smaller countries in smaller uh, for smaller languages like Georgian, that has to in be initiated by the governments. And that's where the resources have to um, go to. And then maybe I will advocate for two things here. Uh, one is open source models uh, and smaller models that require uh, less compute power that will enable smaller countries and smaller languages to develop um, their own um, generative AI models. Thank you. Yeah, and, and one of the things that's been um, in the past, it's been uh, assume that you need tons of data to get some of these results. And the way the technology is evolving and what we're already seeing with models learning from other models is you don't need much data with some of these things, right? So you can have a very small amount of data from an indigenous language or a language that's not widely spoken and the models are learning how to translate that uh, into those languages. So I think the future is extremely bright for accessibility by making these technologies open and allowing DMCs to actually start deploying it in the context that makes sense for them. Yeah, I think you could also compare it with the navigation tools everyone has on his phone is 
what is the value? So there is a navigation tool, there's a platform, but at the end, what is the, are the local business getting out of it that they can make now easier do publicity when you're in the neighborhood of them or when you they, they pop up where the hotel is or whatever. So I think there is um, the public-private cooperation, and I, I want to, it's for me kind of important where sometimes the, the private sector gives you the platform, but it can be used in different use cases for small languages to build their own thing because if I answer your question, what should it be a, a native in language learning model uh, or should it be translation? My answer is native because you have expressions in, in, in the languages that are completely different that don't translate very well or don't even exist. So I think for me, objectively, it's already settled in my head. It should be native. Um, but then work together, get these languages filled in in the models and then you get better results out of it. So we have a few questions online. I want to go to one of them that's uh, for sort of a follow-up that says, do you believe that the capabilities and potential of artificial intelligence are currently overestimated and are we placing too much hope um, on its impact? Um, and I'll start by saying it definitely is over, you know, the, the tech industry lives on hype. Every vendor, every, every startup has to overhype to be, win in the market. And we see um, these, these realistic stories of where it's failing miserably. But it is doing something that almost none of us expected to get to by now. Uh, this, this conversational, it's a new way of interacting. You know, it's really, it's very similar to the original Google search where you could search the world's information and have all this stuff come to you. Now it's talking to you with that information and it misses a lot of it, and it's overestimated, and there's a lot of gaps. Um, but the other thing, people don't know what the limit is. As you train more and more, uh, is it going to reach some sort of asymptote where it, it fails to go to the next level when you're training you know, GPT-5 or Gem the next Gemini? You know, we don't know. I think the real question is nobody knows. Everybody knows the current level is overhyped, but really, it's, it's evolving so quickly. We don't know where that next endpoint is. That's really the issue. It's not today. It's what's going to be a year from now, two years from now. We just don't know. Yeah, I do want to bring... So I think you need to think about the 20 or 80-20 rule. Is I think on, on most of the language learning models, we have done 20% of efforts to get 80% of the outcome. But the marginal improvement of the next efforts will be, the marginal gain will be smaller. So the effort to make a language model, so the, the, the question is when will a first language model write the best novel in your language, in your, in your world, or in your, in your local language? It will never happen. Because the marginal gain is too, too costly, too inefficient to get there. So there is an, so there is an, there's now we did, it's impressive what they did, they will improve even more, but will it ever be the best Roman, whatever you, you call it in your language? No, it will never get there. Because that's not what it's meant to do. It's again, it is a good model, it gives you a lot of good text, but the texts are not perfect yet. And they will not never get perfect. Because a human being will always get that smart differentiator in the way to, to think about things. So Yeah, I agreed. I I, I do think there's a lot of hype, um, but to be fair to AI, uh, it really is impressive. The, the fact that artificial intelligence can scan billions of radiology reports and can detect a cancer better than expert radiologists, that's impressive. Uh, the fact that we've used uh, AI in our data centers to reduce energy consumption by 40%, very impressive. So in like very specific applications, I, I don't think there's hype. I think AI is really, really, really impressive. Um, but I like to think of it, uh, the analogy, I think in some of the hype is that AI is smarter than us. I have a four-year-old son. I think he's a bright kid, although sometimes I worry uh, uh, whether that's uh, actually true, like when he's running into a wall or, or something like that. Um, but if you think about my four-year-old son, uh, this guy can uh, open and close his eyes, he can walk, he can talk, he actually talks in three languages, uh, uh, he doesn't fall, uh, when he, there's multiple things that he's doing all at once without even thinking about it. 
and this is a four-year-old, right? We don't have an AI that can do all of those applications at the level that humans uh, can do. And I think a lot of the hype is, is attributing uh, artificial intelligence to, to human intelligence, and I do think that's overhyped. Okay, we have um, a couple more questions, and if folks want to raise, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, this is a good question about um, the internet has made people move away from um, physical connection with people to virtual. And um, where do we think AI will disrupt how we lead our lives? And, I, and my perspective here is that this is a natural progression. You know, my kids grew up with uh, Minecraft and, and Roblox and they play, they get together with their friends and then they also get together online with their friends and it's just natural. It, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You know, there are bad things that happen online, but there's also, you know, and it just opens up the world for more connections. So, um, but we do need to manage that to protect people when they're getting online and not having the, the protections that are needed. Um, and AI is just another, another layer on top that creates more opportunity for engagement, also more opportunity for, um, for problems. And I think, I think we need to have a, a regulatory model where if you're interacting with an AI online, you should know that it's an AI. And if you don't know, that's, that's a problem. And uh, I don't think we're quite there yet. And we are, I think we are having, you know, there's a lot of AIs putting things out on Twitter. You're not interacting with, speaking to it like you think it's a human. But that is going to happen, and we, we need to be aware of that. Any other comments? <laughs> Open-ended question? I think we have to watch out that we did, did don't take what we have experienced in our youths is not what the, we think the youth needs to experience as well, and that we all know it better. I think kids today are smart enough to figure out what works for them. They learn how to use social media, they learn, they live with it, the social media uh, um, native, I would say. And they, what I see in, I have four kids, so, kind of, a, and you have more, so you, you win. But, um, so my four kids, what I see them, each of them are different. And what we do see, and they, they use the social media in a different way, in the way they like it, to be honest. And so I think we should, as parents, not be too judgmental on how they should do things, and, and, and they should go play more outside, or they should, um, that, that, our parents were saying the same thing about us. Don't forget that. So don't don't, don't forget. So I'm a, I'm a bit more optimistic. It's, they will figure it out. They will do what they like most. And human interaction as a warmth and an additional element to it, as a risk as well to it, but as an, a warmth and a, and a benefit to it, that will overcome the risk, I think. And in that way, they'll take the right decisions for them. Um, so um, I'm uh, quite positive that they will use it in the right way. My kids use ChatGPT for certain things, and they know if you use it to write an essay in school, you will fail, because yeah. it's just not good. <laughs> and uh, they know that it's, the writing level is not good enough to get an A. They should use Gemini. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, just to add that um, I think sometimes we forget that internet is very much powered by AI. And a lot of the issues that we've seen in social media is because of the algorithms and then the, the, the way um, they've been sort of left unchecked. Um, so let's not blame it all on the internet. It's, AI has been there from the beginning. Um, I think we can speculate what the future looks like, but I think there were a few things that I was thinking about. One is trust. I think how we approach online content will definitely change. This is almost sort of post-truth world where you, you have to question what you're seeing online uh, more and more um, with the advent of uh, large language models. Uh, recommendation systems is something that sometimes worries me a lot uh, in terms of um, sort of uh, sort of radicalizing yourself into yourself, if that makes sense. Um, getting more and more recommendations and not really exploring uh, new perspectives. Um, that, again, has been a problem, but it has been exacerbated because of um, AI. And then I think interpersonal relationships are just relationships will also change. I think we might rely a lot on 
um, sort of chatbots for uh, to sort of address some of those uh, needs. I think loneliness has been increasing so much across the world, and will AI fill that gap? Probably. How do we deal with that? Is the the challenge? So Biangzhou is actually doing a project in this area um, in uh, People's Republic of China um, in partnership with uh, organizations there. Um, not to go too broad into sociology, but there is an underlying risk that I think we need to be cognizant on. And essentially, if you think about from a regulatory or from a um, societal perspective, need to make sure it's kind of controlled. So we, if you think about us as humans, we constantly fight the urge to tribalize ourselves. If you think about the whole nature of globalization, cooperation, exchange of information, but there is an inert aspect of being with people that think and speak and whatnot dissimilarly. And if you look at one of the potential risks that has come from the internet is that you kind of congregate around people that speak and you know the whole aspects of echo chambers. That's where potentially there is an underlying risk, that, just to bring it up, or to something to think about, whereby there's actually been recently in The Economist I was reading, whereby actually there's a trend, especially young men, which are now actually having a lot of talking to quote unquote female chatbots that are actually giving them a, comp a she, basically. Yeah, if you saw the movie, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. so that is something that we do probably need to think of. I guess from an external perspective, in terms of how do we make sure that? And I'll give you a very simple example. And, and just the comment earlier, I've got five kids. One of my kids were in the park and they fell down or something was happening. Came to me and they were crying. I was like, you know, you know, Dad, that's not fair. And I just looked at him and said, Get used to it. Life is not fair. <laughs> and like I could hear pins drop all around me. But we actually have to introduce that into AI introduce that element of actually providing information that's actually deliberately not always tailored to what you're expecting. Because if you think about it, sometimes when you walk down the street and you take the left instead of the right, when you search for information and you get something random that you weren't looking for, that is something that we probably need to introduce whereby something that we're not expecting in order to make sure that that congregation, that tribalization doesn't occur to a certain extent. But from a sociological point of view. Great. Um, one maybe last question from online, and then we'll go here. This is a, a, a really relevant um, that the question is, Georgia needs support in AI development and in education. Are plans for your companies and organizations to uh, support uh, Georgia or the region with, uh, with this? Well, we're, uh, at Google, I mean, we, we see this as a big part of how um, each of us will um, implement AI in our lives, right? D digital literacy, uh, being educated about AI, its benefits, its risk, et cetera, is a big uh, part of what we're doing. So around the world, uh, including here in the region, we're investing heavily in AI education, uh, partnering with governments around uh, the world, particularly here in, in, in the region. Uh, on that. Um, Saul Khan mentioned this in, in, in his uh, remarks kind of subtly, but YouTube is one of the, the, the world's largest learning platforms. Uh, and it's so much uh, uh, learning material there about AI that's open and accessible by everyone around the world. And what we're trying to do is get governments to leverage that and funnel it to uh, the areas where they need for their young people and for uh, folks who need to transition their skills for the new jobs that will be available uh, as a result of AI. So it's something we're very focused on at Google and investing pretty heavily in. Do you have Google jobs in, in Georgia? <laughs> Not yet, okay. Yeah, so from our soccer point of view, we have, um, we are working with universities, not yet in Georgia, but really open to do it. But we are working curriculums based on what are the needs in the market of technologists that get, get a job in Georgia. So that's an important one that we try to educate in the country for the country. Um, and, and, and we're looking then mostly with the universities, what is kind of the needs in the market for technologists, for government functions, as well as for corporate functions. And then we see how we build up the curriculum and then make a bit of promotion on it to attract more students in that program. So also happy to do that with Georgia or any neighboring country or any of the countries that are in the, in the in around. Um, we have a large experience, we think, also there, the best curriculums in, in education, especially in cybersecurity and AI, are given by people that do the job, so not just by academics. So that's also the reason why we say, and we're willing as MasterCard, together with other uh, technology companies, um, to help to build that curriculum and have guest courses in those curriculums as part of the education. 
um, because we think then you also follow the trends of the market, you follow the latest and the greatest in, in AI. I think uh, so very open to the invite here. So we have only two minutes, and I don't want to hold you longer than the schedule because it's a long day. Um, is there a very short question somebody has? Okay, right here. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> uh, you know, AI is uh, increasingly taking burden off us, and you know we are outsourcing a lot of complex things that things that we were doing, which is good. And my question is, I, I think you know uh, neuroscientists would answer better, but I'm going to ask anyhow. Uh, you know, is this good for our creative capacity in the sense that you know we are not going to deal with a lot of stuff that we were doing, but on the other hand, the trade-off would be, I'm concerned. Maybe we are, uh, you know, our brain is getting lazy, so we are not using it that much. So I'm not sure whether it is good or bad, but I tend to think that it would be a positive outcome because we don't know yet, because we have never experienced as human being, you know, you know, to to use our brain in a creative way without using uh, dealing with a lot of those admin stuff. Let's say. Um, if just very, very briefly, and I'll hand it over. I'm, I am fully on the opening up for creativity. Having said, and I'll give you an example. Uh, again, simple AI application that we did for our auditors, you know, the poor folks usually get forgotten, freed out a thousand hours of their life. And they were actually starting to be able to think, I mean, maybe some people are like, oh my God, you don't want to give creativity to auditors. But essentially, really starting to think of how they can do their job better. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the folks in tax think of optimization. Uh, when my best friend called me up when the first version of you know, LLMs were out and, like, and she's a teacher, it's going to lose all our job. It's like, no, now you can finally start teaching, not mm -hmm. just how to teach a pass an exam. Mm -hmm. So fully on that side, having said that, those who want to be lazy will become lazy. No. Uh, <laughs> so uh, one last comment. Yeah, just um, be aware and just look at history, human history. Most of our inventions comes from laziness. Yeah. So bicycle, car, it's not because we want to. So just be aware, the biggest incentive of innovation is laziness. And that creates, but that allows you to do other things that otherwise are not possible. So that's what I would answer here as well philosophically is people will then spend time on other things. They like more to do more. Yes. So that will be the creativity over there. Yes. Thank you. So the, the great philosophers of Greece were a product of all of their free time that they created by having so much uh, innovation. So thank you, thanks for everyone. It's a great panel uh, for all of you to come here. It was a, you know, a long trip and out of the way, but we benefit so much. So let's give them a round of applause. And I'm sure if you have follow-up questions, folks will be around you know, immediately after, and, and uh, you can get our contact information, reach out via email as well. So we're looking forward to continue to engage over the next several years on this topic, and let's make it work better. <laughs>